Welcome to the Bourne Catamount United Methodist Church home worship service. As we go through the service today, please sing along with the hymns and read the bold print in all of the readings. Enjoy the service. Also today, we are having outdoor worship services at both churches and we will continue to do this weather providing in the future and we will produce this movie also so if you choose to come to church you can or you can stay home and watch this video either way thank you for uh, for letting us into your home for this service thank worship this, mo this morning by reading Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For, for there, there the Lord has commanded, commanded the blessing, blessing life forevermore. forevermore.
Let's be together in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and generous God, we thank you for this good day that you have made. Thank you for all the ways you are working to bring healing, forgiveness, accountability, and reconciliation in your church and in your world. Help us, Lord, to pause often and be aware of your presence. Help us to remember to ask your help always with our every need. Remind us of your every blessing and to give you thanks with gratitude. Help us, Lord God, we pray, to extend grace as we have been given grace to practice patience with one another and with all of our neighbors. Bless all our worship, all our loving and serving, all of our fellowship now and throughout the week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray the words that he taught us together as we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Romans, chapter 11, verses 1 to 2a and 28b to 32. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. As, As regards, regards election, election they, they are beloved. For, for the sake of their ancestors, ancestors for the gifts and the calling of God are, are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may, receive, may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Good morning and welcome to Children's Time. I'm just looking at the scary face in the back of me. Look at those eyes. I hadn't noticed that. I hope it isn't frightening to you. Well, do you ever get angry? This cat behind me looks really angry um, and say some unkind and mean things to someone. Often we do that because um, we don't know the person very well and we just assume they're a certain way because they look different from us or they act different from us or they think different from us. Tony the cat and I have been busy while it blanches killing ants. And so when I read today's story about a, a young man, a boy, and an ant, I feel really really guilty. Marconi does too. So we're going to have to rethink ourselves. So let's listen to the story about the tiny ant. Hey Little Ant by Philip and Hannah Hoos. Illustrations by Debbie Tilly. Little ant down in the crack. Can you hear me? Can you talk back? See my shoe? Can you see that? Well now it's gonna squish you flat. Please oh please do not squish me. Change your mind and let me be. I'm on my way with the crumb of pie. Please, oh please, don't make me die. Anyone knows that ants can't feel. You're so tiny that you don't look real. I'm so big and you're so small. I don't think it will hurt at all. But you're a giant and giants can't know how it feels to be an ant. Come down close. I think you'll see that you are very much like me. Are you crazy? Me like you? I have a home and a family. You're just a speck that runs around. No one would care if my foot came down. Oh, big friend, you are so wrong. My nest mates need me because I am strong. I dig out nests and feed baby ants too. I must not die beneath your shoe. But my mom says ants are rude. They carry off our picnic food. They steal our chips and breadcrumbs. 
It's good if I squash a crook like you. Hey, I'm not a crook, kid. Read my lips. Sometimes ants need crumbs and chips. One little chip can feed my town. So please don't make your shoe come down. But all my friends squish ants each day. Squishing ants is a game we play. They're looking at me. They're listening too. They say I should squish you. Now I can see you're big and strong. Decide for yourself what's right and wrong. If you were me, and I were you, what would you want me to do? Should the ant get squished? Should the ant go free? It's up to the kid. It's not up to me. We'll leave the kid with the raised-up shoe. What do you think that kid should do? Wow, does that make you think differently about ants? Well, it does me.、Um, but basically, that ant is pretty wise, and he's telling us, you know, that everybody has their own side of the picture, their only own version of their life, and their own problems, and difficulties, and joys in living our lives. So the more we can、um, take joy in listening to people and getting to know people, especially those that think differently than us, that look different than us. Um, that worship different than us, because God has a very inclusive circle. It's a big circle, and He wants us all in it together, worshiping Him and loving Him and His people. And a lot of the things that Jesus was saying in today's reading from the Gospel was that the,、um, particularly the very religious. Jewish people were very focused on rules: what was clean, what was unclean, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And he said, "Don't worry so much about all of that. You need to think about what comes out of your mouth goes directly to somebody's heart." So he's saying, "Think before you speak, and speak with a loving voice." I had this is kind of an example. I had this great idea for what to do with my toothpaste when I got. I was like pushing it all in here, and I thought, "Well, I'll put it in this bowl, and it'll be so much easier for me to get it out when I, I brush my teeth." But then I thought, "Why did I do that? I really, I really want it back in this tube.、Uh, do you think I could get it back in if I suck it back in and stuff? Oh my gosh, it just doesn't work. I have a problem." Well, that's what happens when we say unkind things, and when unkind things come out of our mouth, we can't ever put them back. Once you hurt somebody, you can't ever make that hurt disappear. But you can think before you speak, and that makes all the difference. Have a blessed day. Love you. Amen. And our second reading this morning is from Genesis chapter thirty-seven, verses one through eight, nineteen to twenty-four, and verse twenty-eight. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being seventeen years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was the help a helper to the sons of Billa and Zilpa, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a, ba- a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But, But when his, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them. Listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered round it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, "Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us?" So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. They said to one another. Here, Here comes, comes the, the dreamer. dreamer. 
Now, come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and And we we shall shall see see what what will become become of his his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered it. He delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and And they they took took him and and threw threw him him into into the pit. pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And And they they took took Joseph Joseph to to Egypt. Egypt. reading is from Genesis chapter 45 now verses 1 through 15. Hear the word. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him and he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. Now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry, bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. 
and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. From the opening verses of our first reading from Genesis this week, on to the next 14 chapters, all the way to the very end of Genesis, the biblical spotlight is kept on Joseph. Yet, we're told today this is the story of the family of Jacob, daddy of Joseph and 11 other brothers and some daughters, husband of four wives, Jacob, who wrestled all night famously with the angel and received a huge blessing and a new name, Israel. But still goes, the patriarch Jacob still goes by his old name, Jacob, meaning deceiver, as well as his new name, Israel, God wrestler. And the whole family of Jacob now shares in this mixed heritage of blessings in God wrestling and lying, cheating, deceiving and mistreating one another. In our very first reading, we have this quick sketch of family dynamics. See, especially Joseph at age 17, second youngest of the sons of Jacob, but the first of the two sons born to his favorite wife, Rachel. Rachel, his beloved, who died giving birth to Benjamin, her other son. His father's blatant favoritism toward him and Joseph's annoying habit, to say the least, of tattling to dad about his brother's behaviors has caused his brothers to hate J Joseph more and more. When he tells his family about this dream in which they all bow down before him, it's like a last straw. He'll have another dream much the same. Now it's only a matter of time till the brothers are talking about killing Joseph before finally deciding to just tear his clothing, put some blood on it, and tell their father that he was killed by a wild animal and sell him into slavery down in Egypt. We're necessarily skipping over quite a bit of family story between our first reading in chapter 37 and our second in chapter 45. By way of a greatly abridged story summary, Joseph is sold to an official in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he turns out there to be such a gifted manager that his master soon puts him in charge of all the household, the whole estate. His master's wife likes Joseph. She tries to seduce him. He refuses her affections. She accuses him of attempted rape. He's thrown in prison. But there again, he quickly rises. His managerial skills are such that soon he is made second in command to the prison warden. While they're in jail, he interprets the dreams of two former court officials of Pharaoh who've been thrown in jail. One of them is executed later, the other is restored to power. A few years later, when Pharaoh has this disturbing dream of seven fat cows swallowed up by seven skinny, scrawny, barely alive cows, followed by a second dream that same night in which seven fat, fat ears of grain are consumed by seven shriveled up, dying ears of grain. Uh, none of the advisors of Pharaoh can interpret this dream, this dream that Pharaoh knows has to be important. But now finally the court official whose dream had been interpreted by Joseph in prison remembers finally Joseph's gift for understanding dreams, tells the king, and Joseph is cleaned up and brought out of jail into Pharaoh's court where he hears the dream and immediately tells Pharaoh. The dream means seven years in which grain and livestock will flourish, followed immediately by seven years of famine. Then without a pause, Joseph advises Pharaoh. He wasn't asked for further advice, but he gives it. Collect the grain, store it in the years of abundance, so there will be enough in the lean years. Pharaoh is so impressed by the skill of Joseph and by his ability to understand the mysterious things that he makes him on the spot, prime minister of the land, secretary of agriculture and more, a minister with multiple portfolios, he gets married him off to Asenath, daughter of an Egyptian priest, 
They have two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and now everyone in the land of Egypt except Pharaoh must bow the knee before Joseph. Now the seven years of abundance have come and gone, and the famine years have begun. Canaan, the land where Jacob and family live and have the ancestors have been living, is hit by the famine also. Jacob sends all of his remaining sons except Benjamin, the youngest, down to Egypt to buy grain. More than 20 years now have passed since Joseph was sold into slavery. When they come before him now to buy grain, his brothers do not recognize Joseph, who is now wearing the clothing of Egyptian royalty. But he recognizes them right away. He remembers their faces, remembers their voices, remembers exactly how they treated him when they sold him like a sheep or a goat or a cattle, a cow or cattle, bound off for market never to be seen again. Now his brothers come before Joseph, bowing low, just as he had dreamed long ago. He interrogates them. He accuses them of being spies. He makes them grovel, a little in supplication as they're asking him to be able to buy food. Joseph may, in fact, have been expecting the brothers to show up eventually. He knew the famine was stretching beyond the borders of Egypt. He may well have rehearsed a scene somewhat like this in his heart many times. We don't know that, but we do know he shows not a trace of hesitation as he sets about teaching his brothers what it feels like to be treated the way they treated him. Brothers who sold their brother for silver and deceived their father, claiming Joseph had been killed by a wild beast, have come now bearing silver to buy food, and Joseph conceals his identity and holds them as prisoners in the jail of Egypt for three days. Reading just a little between the lines, consulting the commentaries of the rabbis of Israel of old, we can guess that as far as Joseph's concerned, the brothers really were the wild beasts that were made up by the brothers, but the real-life wild beasts were the brothers that in fact killed young Joseph, ended his old innocent life back home, tore his life apart, tore the life of their elderly father apart, like the tattered remnants of the coat that his father made him, the coat that inspired such jealousy, the coat his brothers tore and dipped into goat's blood to convince their father of the story they made up. When he overhears his brothers speaking to each other, Finally now admitting to each other their guilt, finally acknowledging to each other that this crisis is the result of their own making, the result of their selling Joseph into slavery long ago. It's payback time, they say to each other. Joseph now has to finally get quick out of, get out of his brother's sight and out of their hearing range and weep and weep by himself. But he will not reveal himself to his brothers. He sends them all back down to Canaan with those, their wagons full of grain, except for Simeon, the brother he holds hostage till the rest will return with Benjamin. He knows they're going to run out of grain. He knows he wants to see Benjamin in the worst way. The brothers go home. They tell their father Jacob about the trip, about the prime minister of Egypt who has promised he won't give them any more, won't sell them any more grain, not unless they bring their other brother Benjamin, who he's forced them to tell about in order to prove that their story really is true. They're not making it up. They're not spies. But Jacob will not let go of Benjamin, the only remaining son of his beloved Rachel. He won't let Rachel... Rachel's son, Benjamin, go down to Egypt. Only when their food is almost gone will Jacob finally consent to send Benjamin with the other brothers back down to Egypt so the family can survive. When he finally sees his brother Benjamin, his mother's only other son, who was just a little child when Joseph was taken away from the family and vanished, the only brother not part of the pack, the pack of if wild animals who sold him into slavery, jo J Joseph's feelings now are overwhelming, more than he can bear. 
Again he goes away by himself and weeps alone apart from his brothers. But perhaps now we sense an urge in him to begin to forgive. It's still mixed with unresolved issues of anger and of hurt. He is not yet ready to forgive. His plan is to make the family drama unfold slowly, very slowly. So he arranges to make it appear as if Benjamin has stolen a cup from him. And he says he will hold Benjamin now hostage now while the rest of you brothers can go home and return with your father, intending to make the brothers experience as much as possible the suffering that he went through because of them. And hoping, of course, at the same time to be reunited with his father. But now that Brother Judah hears this news, he, he just can't bear to hear that thought. And Judah gives this long and passionate speech saying that if their father Jacob is to hear that Benjamin is gone, being held prisoner far from home, Jacob's heart is going to break. He's going to die as soon as he hears that story. He's told us many times he cannot bear the loss of Benjamin. He's lost Joseph. And now Judah offers himself as a hostage in place of Benjamin, saying, please take me, make me your hostage, not Benjamin. And the combination now of hearing that his father might indeed die before he would get to see him, and hearing that the brother, even one of the brothers, is finally offering to make some kind of personal sacrifice on behalf of somebody else, their father, who he loves, and indirectly for Benjamin, suddenly this combination of new revelation seems to release Joseph from his need to see justice and vengeance accomplished. Now finally Joseph weeps and weeps and weeps, can no longer contain or control himself, and finally he is beginning to really, really forgive. With tears of bitter, sweet release, as he reveals himself to his brothers, no longer able to hold back. The story of Joseph and his brothers, the story of Jacob and the family of Jacob, is the story of our biblical family of origin. The story of how we were already in the promised land, but unable to stay there because of all our family issues unresolved, our inability to live as if we were in the promised land. A story that sounds to me a lot like America today and uncomfortably like a lot of the church today. Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers has been called Israel's original sin by many of the rabbis of old. And Joseph for sure is the one most sinned against here, grievously sinned against, but the rest of Genesis also records how Joseph enslaves all the farmers of Egypt who have to sell their land and labor to Pharaoh and become slaves in exchange for food in the famine years. Joseph's policies that indeed save lives and are highly enlightened in the time of famine will create new serious problems further down the road. This is the story of all of Israel, the family of Israel, the family of Jacob, making its way down the road to Egypt, the story of how a small family of just 70 people go down to Egypt ragged and hungry, torn apart as a family, and become a nation in exile. A story to be continued. This is the story of God taking things that people have meant for harm and turning them into good. A phrase Joseph will say in almost those words at the end of Genesis. And thank God, of course, in the fullness of God's time, Jesus the Messiah has indeed come into this world for us all. And because of Jesus who takes even the evil of the cross and turns it into God's triumph over all the forces of death, sin, and evil, now everything in heaven and earth has changed, fundamentally, wonderfully, for the better. That's why the Apostle can tell us today in Romans that all of Israel's story, all the story of the family of Jacob, good, bad, ugly, and beautiful, will continue to be part of God's plan to save as much as possible all the nations and peoples of earth, including, of course, 
all of Israel, since Romans tells us God's promises to our ancestors are irrevocable. Yet, as Jesus our Lord and as all the New Testament letters and writings also tell us, human nature doesn't change age to age, and being accountable for our actions and our need to forgive and be forgiven also does not change. So we pray the Lord's Prayer every day. Forgive us our sins, our debts, our trespasses as we forgive and struggle to forgive our, those who sin or dead or in, trespass against us. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to forgive. The Bible and human history also teach us from the get-go, forgiving is often not easy. Not for us, not for others either. As God's people, we are expected to keep wrestling with our history, our heritage, our inner conflicts, our outward struggles for justice, mercy, peace, and righteousness. The struggle continues. I still have a long list of people I find difficult to forgive, but I'm finding consolation in today's stories in the thought that probably none of the people I'm having difficulty forgiving are as hard to forgive as his brothers were for Joseph. I keep trying to count my blessings, therefore, and forgive everyone every day, and I keep trying to thank God all the time that it isn't harder than it is, and not high and hard not to make it harder than it has to be. I keep praying for others to forgive me. That makes it easier for me to forgive. I keep realizing this may be harder for some to do than I realize. It may not be so easy to forgive me at times for some of my brothers and sisters, some of the family of God. Forgive me, I pray, but help me to get better at forgiving. I also pray and help me to do less that makes people have to forgive. And the more I stay in this story of all God's people, the more I recognize the people I don't readily recognize and see as family still turn out to be my family anyway. Because in this story of the family of Jacob, this story of the family of Israel, this story of the people of God, this story of seriously flawed human beings like us, learning to see ourselves as all part of one family, learning to forgive and be forgiven, learning to accept the consequences of our actions rather than to blame others, learning to love in spite of and because of our past, here we have the outline of God's perfect plan for our future. The future spoken of by our psalmist today, where we, God's people, will dwell together in unity. How very good and pleasant that is when we receive the blessing that God has commanded God's blessing, life forevermore. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, let's sing. Make me a channel of your peace.
Let's begin our time together of prayer and praise with a moment of silent prayer and reflection. And let's continue to give our thanks and praise to God. Thank you, dear and holy God, for all your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for our families, our friends, our neighbors. Thank you for all your church, and thank you for all who are helping to keep your church flourishing in ministry to this day. Thank you for our life together in Christ. Thank you most of all, Lord God, for your gracious presence with us. We pray for all our parish, all participating in our worship in person this week or online, any way, any time throughout the week, people join us in worship. Thank you, God. Bless it, us, Lord, in the worship to be a blessing. We continue to lift up all who are homebound, sick or ill, struggling with health issues. We pray for all who are in economic need, those who need work or more work or different work, those who need financial assistance, those who suffer from depression or anxiety in these times, that's pretty normal, Lord. Help us through it. We continue to pray for our homeless, the hungry, those in prison, and those imprisoned by circumstance. We continue in prayer for all our parish, Lord. Praying again for Fran Spears and family, Dottie Carter and Robbie, Mary Peterson, Captain Karen, Alan Matson, Skip Brunetto, Keith Markey suffering from lymphoma, Carol Ann Du Bois and her daughter Ken, Jen especially, and her husband Jen, Ken, Jen and Ken, Du and Dom, our custodians, doing such a good job keeping our buildings clean and safe, our trustees, our finance committees, all who are helping to keep us in good shape. We continue to pray for all our congregation as we are beginning weather permitting outdoor worship this week. Bless Lord God to remind us masks and social distancing, all the best practices. We pray for the 12 step groups, a few small ones at our meeting, thrift shop volunteers and shoppers, Lord, keep safe. We continue to ask you to send us your prayers, your prayer requests for each other. We continue in prayer for first responders, healthcare workers, police firemen, grocery workers, teachers, school workers, children and families in preparation for school, all that goes into that. We pray for more and more care for each other in the wider community all around us. Pray for our nation as we prepare for elections, all the challenges of mail ballots and in-person ballots, Lord, Sort it out for us. Give us wisdom. Give us discernment. We pray for healing of division. We pray for restoration of civility and neighborliness. We pray to prevail by God's grace in grace. We continue to pray for people and places in other lands afflicted in turmoil. We're praying this week especially for Belarus, the birth country of Tatiana, our music director in Born country in turmoil with uh, stolen elections and peaceful protesters pushed down and imprisoned and beaten. We pray for those in our own streets for peace and restoration of civility. We pray justice, but we pray civility equally. We continue to give you thanks and praise for all the ways we see your love, holy God, at work in your world. And we pray for wisdom and discernment humility of heart and gentleness of spirit, as Jesus our Lord has taught us by word and example. We pray, Lord God, for your love and your grace to rule in every heart and to flourish throughout the land. These and all the prayers of our hearts we lift in the strong name of Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, as we prepare our hearts, to give in the spirit of joy, may we continue to listen to our offertory music in the spirit of prayer and gratitude, remembering all the ways that you, Lord God, have blessed us and are blessing us always. 
guiding us, teaching us, encouraging us to be a blessing for others. Amen. Please join us in reading the prayer of dedication. Thank you, Holy Lord, for working, healing, forgiveness, reconciliation, accountability, and restoration between us and you, and between us and other people made in your image. Help us appreciate all the grace you give, practice patience with one another, extend grace to each other, and contribute in whatever ways we should to your work of healing and restoration of right relationship. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, who embodies healing, forgiveness, and restoration. Amen. Please join us in singing the hymn and Are We Yet Alive? Thank you.
to love and serve our gracious and awesome God. Share the good news of Jesus every way you can, any way you can. God will be with you till we meet again.